We will now focus on future commodity movements from Saskatchewan with Mr. Steve McLean, CEO of the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. Steve is the CEO of the Saskatchewan Chamber since 2007. He has held several senior positions in Saskatchewan business community as an employee, owner and manager. He also served on dozens of local, provincial and national board of, of directors and was elected as chair on many of them. As a lifelong resident of Saskatchewan, he understands and firmly believes in the potential that exists in the people and businesses within the province. Steve is married and has two children. Please welcome Steve to our meeting. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Always a pleasure to serve as a warm-up act for your ad. Um, I'm here to tell you about a study that we did on behalf of the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce and to share with you some of the recommendations that we, through the Conference Board of Canada, who we contracted to do the study, came forward with. And our objective was based on a on sort of an, uh, uh, two things. One of them was, in the fall of 2013, a couple of amazing things happened in Saskatchewan. If you asked many of our long-term residents, particularly the farmers, in the summer of, or the spring of 2013, and said, what would make this an amazing year for you? Some of them would have said, how about a home field Grey Cup win for the Rough Riders, and a bumper crop across the province. And some of them would have said Pilsner for five bucks a 24. That didn't happen. But the first two did. We had a bumper crop. We had a home field Grey Cup win. And all that we heard about for months in that fall was the green and white. Now, God bless the green and white. Nobody in the business community will undervalue the, the commitment that they have, the value they have on our province for bringing us together. But all of a sudden, after they won in November, we stopped talking about the fact that we had a bumper crop. Now, we have had way more bumper crops than we've had Grey Cup wins, and certainly Grey Cup wins at home. But as an organization, as a business organization, we said, this doesn't make much sense. We've just grown more grains than we've ever grown. And we're only talking about the other half of that success in the fall. And then in the early spring through the winter of 2014, we started to hear about the crops, but only from the negative side. Instead of congratulating the women and the men who grew them, we heard in the media the challenges of getting them to market. We also heard, with all due respect to our politicians, federal and provincial, the challenges that were raised and said, in, in the sense of saying, it's their fault, it's their fault, we've got to do this differently, and so on. And we said, let's get an understanding of the situation. And so as an organization that represents, to some extent, not only the agricultural sector, but also the mining sector and the oil sector, we said, let's get a picture that's more broadly than just what we've heard of late. We understood that the rail was a critical element to our success as a province, economically, socially, culturally. We understood that as our oil sector continues to produce more and ship more by rail, the pressure on those rail lines were of significance. We also knew, with all due respect again to the rail lines, that there was more that they could do and needed to do and were working on that. So we said, let's figure this out. One final note before I get into the elements of it, is that we were also as an organization committed to the provincial government's plan for growth. Years ago, in 2007, we created a long-term growth strategy for Saskatchewan because we said it's time that we as a province start to think about things in longer than four-year electoral cycles. And so we said, what do we want to look like by the year 2020? We set objectives of uh, population, number of houses built, and so on. In 2012, the provincial government released a long-term strategy. We looked at it. We embraced it. It makes good sense. And we, as an organization, are working towards this, our strategies to help achieve it, as I know are all of the provincial government ministries and departments, as well as the crowns. It is their marching orders, and we believe that much of it makes great sense. So we said, how is our current situation going to fit with the plan for growth? And more importantly, how does our basic services, we provide it now through the rail lines, going to fit the realities of our current and, and more important future market. We were watching 
I live in Regina. We are watching with great interest the, every single day the number of new oil tankers coming through and around Regina that were displacing in some cases, in fairness, but making, adding more pressure to the capacity of the rail lines. And at that point in time, when we started to see it happen, it was when oil was a lot more than $50 a barrel. And so we may have dodged that bullet for a short term, but it's going to come back. And we're going to start shipping oil until we get our elector or our politicians north and south of the border understanding the value of pipelines. Those folks are going to be sending the oil on the rail. So quick methodology. We contracted with the Conference Board of Canada. We need somebody who could have the data behind them, the, con the confidence of the sectors that they were speaking to and representing afterwards, as well as we knew that the magnitude of the project took a big picture view. They contracted, uh, uh, contacted dozens of informed observers, uh, shippers, carriers, producers. They went through all the data that was available to them. Some of you, I suspect, in this room perhaps were part of that conversation. They, the result was that significant data was pooled together, and in the actual report, which is available online should you want it, there's lots of information about the kinds of products we're shipping, what the existing volume looks like, as well as the projections look like. And they've also come up with a series of recommendations. Now, this is an interesting area, agriculture, and, and as it relates particularly to rail. If I thought that there was going to be consensus on either of all of our recommendations or amongst the areas and opportunities that could address the access to our export markets through rail, even amongst you in this room, I would be some sort of miracle maker. I'm not. But I do hope that you look at the recommendations that we've got and uh, think that they carry the ball a little bit forward. I'll go through the recommendations and fairly quickly, most of them you'll be familiar with in terminology if not specifics. We talk about and recommend investigating the full impacts of the maximum revenue entitlement. The fact is that 15 years have passed since this was put in place, and so we're recommending that a full and public review is warranted. Other presentations today will, I assume, speak to this issue as well, and whether or not or what happens to the MRE is up to you folks, but indeed, it's a critical issue, needs to be reviewed. We also talked about reducing the cost of shipping by rail and to and from the province. While most of our focus was on the export of our products, which is the largest volume user, we're also cognizant that we have manufacturers in Saskatchewan who, sh who bring in 4,000 rail cars a year of parts, agricultural manufactured parts. They put the pieces together here and ship them out by truck. We know that that's going to change. We also know that the, uh, the uranium industry is going to start to use greater rail capacity. And that too will take up some space on those trains. But one of the things that this talks about is recognizing that there's a, an, an unlevel playing field in terms of the fuel tax on rail lines in Saskatchewan. We're suggesting that we have a look at that. It's 15 cents a liter. It could change a little. It's $40 million, and in the grand scheme of things, is it the be-all and end-all? We don't think so. But it should be a card that's played. We think so, and we encourage our provincial government to do that. We recommend encouraging greater and timelier communication across the logistics supply chain. One of the things that's important here, and this is perhaps the most fundamental of all of the recommendations, is that, and you know this, ladies and gentlemen, I assume much better than I perhaps, but the continuity between the, the field to the port and from the port to the final user, whether it's in China or India or Bangladesh, it doesn't matter. That's a continuum that we have to pay attention to. That supply chain is what makes the difference. And if there's a hiccup in any element of it, it's either pushed back at the levels behind it or rushed forward. And we think that there's an opportunity to create enhanced systems to communicate more effectively and to ensure that shippers uh, and the uh, rail companies are much more on the same page. The supply chain is an absolute continuum, and if we do not have a better system, we're going to be in trouble. And we're going to still point fingers backwards on the line or forwards on the line. And although much of this is outside of our control as grain organizations or provincial governments, 
the idea is that we need to continue to pressure those at the table to make sure that it happens. And if you think it's impossible, I would remind you that this week in the media, we're hearing news of folks who nine years ago sent a space shuttle or a ship or a satellite essentially to Pluto. If people can do that, I guarantee you, you folks can make this system smoother. And I say that knowing with some expectation that there's rail companies, there's grain companies, and there's producers in the room. I'm not asking you to send a ship to Pluto. I'm asking you to get a, a load of lentils to Bangladesh. Increasing the coordination with governments and infrastructure providers outside of the province. Typically, our focus in Saskatchewan has been on within our borders, and rightfully so. There's a lot of cost there. There's a lot of interest that we need to do uh, in terms of putting money in. But the reality of it is, is the Port Metro Vancouver as a major, major component of our, of our uh, shipping processes is critical to us. And if they've got a stomach ache, we feel the pain. So we as a province need to start to think about what we could do there. Even if it's as subtle, as subtle, when they start to do some, get some pushback by neighborhoods, when the number of rail cars rolling by increase and the neighborhoods start to push back. Imagine a billboard from the grain producers or the people of Saskatchewan that said, to the people of BC, we just wanted to say thanks for allowing our grains to go by your neighborhoods. If that lessened the pressure and the backlash and the delays of getting expanded infrastructure in lower mainland BC, would that make sense? I don't know. But I'm saying that we need to start to focus on infrastructure and thought, thinking of those outside of our own borders. Increasing supply chain options and redundancies. I hear from a lot of people that we have two options of significance in order to get our grain shipped by rail, and that's the fact. So we, maybe we need to think about this more broadly. We have good east and west steel. Do we need to start as a country to think north and south more aggressively? There's some regulatory issues that impact that, and quite frankly, those of you that are in the rail business that sit here go, oh, oh, oh. Don't be going there. We need to have that conversation. Was Canada well served when Air Canada was our only airline? I'm not sure. And one of the things that we believe in as an organization is choice. If you're a customer and you don't have choice, you're in trouble. So we need to think about redundancy. We need to think about ways that would allow us to do things differently. It talks about even helping fund icebreakers in the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Because again, if they've got a stomach ache, we've got a pain. In the recommendations, we also talk about considering the full effects of legislative solutions while focusing efforts on long-term rather than short-term solutions. You folks did an excellent job of lobbying the federal government on the issues of 2014, and rightfully so. You had a pain and the federal government had one as well. But I think collectively we need to sort of think long term with some short term actions without question, but also start to think, for example, the decisions made by the federal government in, the, in putting the penalties in for uh, minimal carriage and so on, if they had the right outcome. And now that we've sort of got that surplus through the process, what's, what are we going to do next time? Does that, if the penalty worked, great. If you don't think it did, perhaps we need to think longer term. And uh, the review of the Canadian Transportation Act is a great start, a move in that direction. But what would be a better world, I would think, is if we had our producers and our organizations focusing on more production, better quality product, instead of the hassles of getting it to market. If we can get those issues solved or mitigated in the next short while, we're going to be in a much better situation. One of the things that's interesting, and this is perhaps an outcome of the changes with the Canadian Wheat Board and, and, and the fact that the success of our grain growers and our lentil crops have, have gone so exceptionally well, is that we produce more. And with the markets and the, on -field, the, uh, the farmers selling in a market capacity that they choose when and how they choose, we need to think about making sure that our on-farm storage capacity is correct. 
Now we've been told by the Ministry of Agriculture that this is getting very close to being ac to getting uh, right-sized, if you will. And as a non-farm boy, I drive around the province and I see a lot more steel bins and I see a lot more of the white storage capacity. But we need to think about those things so that when we do have a bumper crop, and I expect we will many, many times in our lifetime, are we ready to keep it in a safe and, and, uh, and uh, solid way? And I know that those jurisdictions around the world who don't have this capacity lose a lot of their crop. And I know there will be people in this room who are producers who have lost Sex or, or, or bushels because of not having the storage capacity or something went wrong. We don't want to make that mistake. So we need to think in the long term if we have the right size. Determining the impact of pipeline expansion. Now it would be a strange thing perhaps for APEST, APEST to send a letter to the Premier and the Prime Minister and said, get those pipelines built. Because he's heard that from the oil companies. He's heard it from us. They have both heard it from us. But here's the self-interest I think you need to be cognizant of, is that the rail companies are responsible to ship products of their clients. And as the oil price comes back up, and it will, there will be more and more oil shipped on the rail. They don't want, the oil companies, that's not their preferential uh, routing. They want to do it through pipelines. It's more cost effective, it's safer, and quite frankly, selfishly for the agricultural sector, it frees up some space on the rail. So I would encourage you to add your voice to the others that are saying, let's get those pipelines built. And you can hear, as we did last week, there was a spill in Alberta, and absolutely it's not a good thing. And that's lots of oil, and it sounds like a disaster. But I'll tell you what, they're going to fix that situation. They're going to find out what went wrong, and they're going to move ahead. And we're much better off to have the odd spill in the pipeline world, I would suggest, than we are to have a bunch of rail cars get off track. So let's all support the, the, the pipeline movement, and hopefully politics will take a, will, uh, the politicians rather will start to consider the options from the big picture. This was an interesting thing that we weren't aware of until we read the study, uh, and it's, it's, it's the issue of hopper car purchasing arrangements. And it came out of the examination that in the, rail, in the rail world, the potash sector had upgraded their rail cars. As a matter of fact, some of our companies have bought their own rail cars. And the oil sector had been, has been moving and will be aggressively moving to new, more high-efficiency cars. And yet the hopper car options weren't as efficient as possible. And so I'd encourage you to think about that. And now, are, am I suggesting that each of you go out and buy 20 cars? Not at all. I'm suggesting as a collective of very intelligent people who are used to thinking about big picture investments, start to think about what hopper cars could look like. And maybe the models that we've got to use them now, to buy them now, are not the only ones available. Maybe there's other options, and I encourage you to look at that, because the efficiency, as we understand it, of the new style of hopper car gives you more capacity and more cars on a rail line. It's important to look at that, so it's the holistic view, if you will. This is the thing that you perhaps know best of all, and as those of you that are in the room that are producers and couldn't get your product off of your farm and the cash wasn't flowing, you understand much of this. The failure to reach the targeted out targets outlined in the plan for growth. And you say, well, that's just a plan. Why would we care about that? For a number of reasons. For the first time in an awful long time, the first time I'm aware of, our provincial government has sat down and said, beyond a four-year plan, we have a comprehensive long-term plan. So the businesses can invest and plan according to it, knowing what the objectives are. The premier in this plan has been exceptionally ambitious in terms of agricultural output. Embrace that, run with that, and it makes good sense for your bottom lines and your producers, but it also means that the province is going to be focused on efforts to help you make that happen. The negative GDP effect of us not being able to get our products to market, and I don't care whether it's oil or lentils or potash, if we can't get it to the person who's willing to buy it, our revenue goes down as a province, as a businesses, and as communities. It also creates limitations on future export growth. If you don't think you can get it to the market, you're not as likely to buy the next quarter over. 
you're not going to buy the new equipment that will allow you to expand. And we can't allow that to happen just because you can't get it to market, and I'm confident we can't. It'll, it'll increase demand for rail transport as oil prices increase. Even if tomorrow all of our elected officials said we're going to build those pipelines, the capacity won't be there soon enough. I'm betting that we're going to have a decent price for oil in the next few years, not a few months, unfortunately, but a few years, and it takes a lot longer than that in some cases to build those pipelines. So be conscious that we need to have solutions that address it uh, in the short term. Deferral of or permanent loss of sale to shippers. If, you're, if you've got a client in Bangladesh or India or doesn't matter where, and two or three times you tell him, I can't deliver, I can't deliver, I can't deliver, he's going to find somebody who says, I can deliver, I can deliver, I can deliver. And as Canadians, we don't want to do that. And it's an interesting thing. That, again, I'm not a farm boy, but I've come to understand this sector very well, fairly well. Nobody understands it very well. But we have gone from a province that used to take our grains down to the end of the, the lane or the road, less than nine miles away often to an elevator, and send it away, and that was it. You have done as producers such an exceptional job of not only growing, increasing the volumes, but getting it to markets, that if we, or more importantly, if you don't do your job today as well as you can, somebody in India tomorrow may not have supper. That's how dramatic we have become as a player in the world food sources. That may not be tomorrow, but it may be the week after. We have become critical, important players, and we need to maintain that role, and I know it makes sense financially, morally, and culturally for us to do that. Increasing operating costs and decrease the profitability for shippers. Anything that makes it more effort to ship or to more costly, uh, takes part of your bottom line. We're not interested in that, and I would suggest you're not either. So we're confident that the solutions will be found, that you in this room are the men and the women who will help, if not lead, the charge to find the solutions to it. We're confident that Saskatchewan's continued agricultural success will, will be blossomed in the next uh, crop year and years after that. And most importantly, we're confident that people around the globe will continue to eat Saskatchewan food for their three meals a day. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, Steve. We have time for questions. Steve has been very good on his time, so we actually have a little more than five minutes. So uh, if you can state your name, please. And uh, James Gray from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Uh, that $40 million tax on fuel, you should be aware that the maintenance is only done from uh, the revenue generated between Melville, Saskatchewan, and Bigger, Saskatchewan on CN. I don't know where it is in the south, but that's where that's generated from. And the volume of traffic going through here means that somebody else is doing the heavy lifting. They might be paying actually $30 million of the $40 million. So before you get too excited about this big saving for us, that's not going to really work. Would you agree? So, I'm sorry, the maintenance is only done between Melville and... Bigger. The, whatever revenue is generated off of the grain movement, say, to Vancouver, yep. that's only... That's done on a per mile basis. So when you go Melville East, that's... <laughs> Yeah, you've got no more revenue uh, generation for Saskatchewan. Uh, that's how they do it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, uh, our understanding was it was a fuel tax piece. So if there's a link to maintenance and the charging of fuel or the fueling up, that's interesting. We'll look into that. And the other math you want to do is uh, watch in the movies because if there's anyone from, like, uh, uh, Texas or that, if you watch in the background, it'll be $3 and something a U.S. gallon equivalent to four liters. So if you're going to ship oil down there for free, I sure could take quite a bit of that uh, and generate revenue off of it. Uh, the other thing is uh, single car efficiency. What is the single car efficiency of the new green car? Single car efficiency? Yes. I don't know offhand. I think it's in the report. On the main line, on yep. the branch line, it's uh, 1.68 on a 100-ton car. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All, off of the, uh, on the welder rail, it's, uh, they can be loaded up to, uh, from 109 to about 111. So uh, that increases the efficiency to 1.86, which is equivalent to a coal car at uh, 53 foot 10 inches. So we got to be very careful on your suggestion. I would think that if you move the cars a little quicker, you would uh, uh, have a lot more efficiency. And you can't because they're pussyfooting around with air. They're doing quota systems. It doesn't work in the past even on a private system because I've watched it there. And there are, I would estimate conservatively, 30% of those cars do not meet minimum air specs of seven and a half inches on the body mounted brake. So there's just uh, a few of the many thoughts that I've got. Yep. And you've got a problem down at Winnipeg on inspections. When their professionals out of the car department and come to Saskatoon, and they five five bad orders, and I've got 15. What does that tell you? You make some interesting points. You're a man who has obviously studied this field well. I, I've had 32 know. years' experience. I've bad ordered probably 10,000 cars. Yep. I am the only one in North America who ever turned a, an opposing railway in because they told me, F off, you old bastard. So I turned them in. They had a uh, hit a truck at Devon, east of Devon, Saskatchewan, and uh, the president of Western Region of CP Rail come and shook my hand <laughs> with regard to that. That they didn't even have 10 percent braking power on that train that hit that truck. That's There's good. how bad things have gone. It's good to Are see. Are you that. aware that the grease that spec for these bearings that they're replacing axles and stuff on? is not spec for this kind of weather. It's inspiring to see a man who uses, uh, when somebody says those words to him, that it's, a, it's a, just a request for more information rather than a turn away. So good for you, sir. There's three C's that we go to have in grain transport. Communication, cooperation, and coordination. If that's no not happening, that's good. Yep. We'd like to see the three Q's, which is quickness, quality, and, and that's not happening either. Wrap it up, please. Thank you. Anyone else? Morning, Judy. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. My name is Judy Dick. I am president and CEO of the Moose Jaw Regina Industrial Corridor. Um, I read your report, Steve. Um, great. Thanks. I wondered, I know it's not addressed in your report, but I was wondering when you were doing the report, were there any discussions about who's going to own the hopper cars? Uh, there isn't. Uh, but listen, there's except in Greece, there's a ton of money around. <laughs> so uh, that's where we need to get creative. In the old model of who owned those cars, it was Saskatchewan had some, the grain companies had some, and so on. What about if we sold, a, I mean, maybe we create a cooperative where we do it. Maybe there's an individual investment option perspective. I don't know. Maybe there's a need to go to to uh, some of our larger inst financial institutions and say, we'd like you to be the to own them and operate them. I don't know the answer to it. What I'm saying is we may not have enough and they may not be good enough. I hear another opinion in terms of other solutions to the same issue. But I, what I'm getting at is let's get creative. If I said to you, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to lock those back doors and nobody leaves here today until we find a solution to who's going to buy those or own or operate those rail cars we'd find a solution by the time your bottoms get sore and you get a little hungry because lunch and dinner hasn't been here, you'd find a solution. So all I'm saying is let's put our best minds together on it. We'll find that solution. I agree because it appears the federal government does not want to replace the cars that have already been lost, and so where do we move forward? And I think yeah. that's one of the discussion pieces, so thank you. Good. You have political leadership in the room. Kathy is here and others. I'm sure from the federal or provincial government as well. So that's part of the solution. But the issue isn't looking to Regina or Ottawa and say, would you buy these for us? There may be a facilitation role for them. But what I'm saying is, if you agree that there's uh, uh, enhanced shipping opportunities by a new model, let's get busy. I have two minutes. One quick question, if there is. Make it quick. 
I just make a comment on name, please? Ernie Hall. Uh, make a comment on, on rail capacity. Uh, BHP isn't in production yet. It's going to come in huge. Yep. Uh, they basically stated that they will buy whatever uh, space they need on the rail system. Uh, where is that going to leave us with our grain mm -hmm. shipping? Because they will pay any price they need to. Eh? Yep, no question. Uh, uh, K, K plus S is in the final stages of development. Uh, EHP will be there. Uh, and we have seen that on the horizon, and we see it now from the oil. The, I mean, the amount of oil cars, I reference it, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but the reality of it is, is those two markets have a, they have a bit of a shelf life issue, of course, but not the oil necessarily, but the oil has, and we've seen it in the labor front, they will pay what they need to to get their product out. And there's a, there's, a, there's a metric that you say, I can afford to pay this much, otherwise I'm giving my product away. In the grains world, we don't want to do that. We have been grain shippers for a long time. We want to continue that. But we need to find measures and processes that don't make the guys that can afford to double or triple the rail cost or the rail, uh, what they pay to ship it, the reality. We need to find that balance. I think we can, but we need to work together to do it. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, Steve, for that. Uh, Thanks, everybody. That presentation. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you.